Uh, good afternoon now, everybody. Uh, welcome to McMinnville City Club March edition. Thank you all for coming out this afternoon on a... It's beautiful for the most part, although every five minutes it changes out there. But uh, uh, I'd like to go over our uh, City Club sponsors real quick. Uh, recognize the businesses uh, that help make this series happen. That is Cellar Ridge Construct Construction. J. L. Kiff Vineyard, Chemeketa Community College, Columbia Bank, McMinnville Area Chamber of Commerce, On Point Community Credit Union, First Federal Savings, Gormley Plumbing and Mechanical, and, well, Larson Motors, which is now Lums Motors. Uh, those are our gold sponsors. Our silver sponsors are First American Title Insurance, Payne West Insurance, The News Register, and our cultural trust uh, sponsors are Stephen Rupp, Philip and Phoebe Newman, and Dan and Mary Corrigan. Thank you so much to all those businesses and individuals. We are coming up towards the end of our 2018-19 season. Uh, we have three left to go. Next month on April 9th, we'll have Miles Davis, the new president of Linfield College, who is just uh, celebrated uh, during an inauguration last week. Uh, in May, sticking with the Linfielders, we will have Professor Nicholas Bucola, who will be speaking on civility, and we'll wrap our season up with Judge Ronald Stone on June 11th, speaking on justice, reflections on a career. But today we have I know her name, I'm not searching for that. Uh, searching the background. Uh, we have Miriam Vargas Corona, who is the uh, executive director of Unidas Bridging Community, which is a advocacy and immigration services nonprofit. She uh, has filled that role since June of last year, becoming the first um, full-time staff member of the organization that's about six years old. Um, and I could go over background, but maybe that would butt into your presentation, so I won't do that. Uh, so without any further ado, please put your hands together for Miriam Vargas Crum. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for coming today. I know it's really nice outside, and it's rare that it's so sunny. So thanks for spending your time indoors with me. Um, so, again, my name is Miriam Vargas Corona, and I am the Executive Director of Unidos Bridging Community. Um, I have only been part of the organization as a staff person for a little while, uh, but previous to that, I was a volunteer and a board member um, since the organization became a nonprofit. So, for almost six years, I was involved uh, as a volunteer. And um, so today I was invited to share with you a little bit about the organization and some upcoming things that we have going on. Um, and in the back table, um, there were some brochures and a handout. Um, if you didn't get one as you came in, uh, please feel free to grab one on your way out. And so the mission of Unidos is to promote the integration, the participation, representation and success of Latino individuals and families in Yamhill County, and to build bridges of understanding and support among Latinos and non-Latinos. So our work is um, done through education, advocacy, leadership development, and immigration supports. Um, where collaborations and uh, relationship building is really essential. Um, so every year uh, we provide a scholarship to Latino students that are currently juniors or seniors in college. And this is through the David Godsey Memorial Scholarship. Um, in order to qualify, students must have graduated from a Yamhill County High School. And so this is a picture of last year's recipients. They're both students at Linfield College right now, 
and um, the young lady is studying to be a math teacher. She's going to graduate this May, um, and she's already been encouraged by the McMinnville School District to apply for an opening, so hopefully she'll be there by the fall. And the young man is studying to be an accountant, and they're both seniors right now. We um, also provide education about immigration-related themes. Um, so kind of like this talk, we're often invited to go to service clubs, to community groups, churches, uh, really anywhere where we're invited, we're happy to come and provide some information about um, immigration issues. And we also bring storytelling. We think it's very impactful for us to bring some of our immigrant neighbors and hear from them, you know, why they chose to immigrate from their home countries, what their situation and circumstances were like over there that really um, pushed them to make the hard decision to leave their life behind and start over here. Um, for our Latino immigrant neighbors, we provide um, education about resources that are offered in the community. Um, oftentimes, uh, our community partners come to Unidos and say, hey, we have this new program, this new service. We really want to make sure the Latino community knows about it. Um, how can we partner? And so we figure out ways to um, share that information with um, our Spanish-speaking Latino community. We also provide trainings of different sorts. Um, sometimes communication with the uh, Latino community uh, needs to be a little bit different than some of our traditional modes of communication for the, um, the general population. And so we offer things like know your rights as an employee trainings, things related to um, you know, uh, their, school, their children's schools, uh, their rights as residents in this country, etc. We also provide free citizenship classes. So for folks that are eligible to become naturalized US citizens, we offer three series every year, and we graduate an average of 75 students. And so these folks, um, we offer the classes either at Chemeketa or PCC in Newburgh. They come two times a week and learn about US uh, civics and history and learn about the process to apply to become a US citizen. So I thought that since I'm here talking with very civic-minded uh, community members, I thought maybe we could review some of these questions that our immigrant neighbors are expected to know about if they want to become a US citizen. So I wonder, might, might we have two volunteers that would be willing to come and play a very short game? Okay, thank you for volunteering. Wait, you might need to stand over there because you're going to see the answers if you stand with me. <laughs> okay, so um, like I mentioned, folks who want to become naturalized citizens, they are expected to know the answers to 100 U.S. Uh, history and civics questions. Um, and ad in addition to that, they're expected to be able to answer written and or oral language tests. And they are interviewed by an immigration official uh, to make sure that uh, their personal history is accurate and they are who they say they are when they're applying. But the questions we're going to ask you are only the history and use civics ones, okay? No. Yeah, should I test them in Spanish? <laughs> For folks who are 55 and older, there is an option to take the um, test in Spanish. Okay, so. The first question is, how many? Do we yell out the answers, or do we have a person? Competition. I didn't bring buzzers. I'm sorry. That would have made it more fun, huh? You could just raise your hand if you have it. How many amendments does the U.S. Constitution have? I saw him raise his hand first. Forty-seven. Yes. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Good job. By the way, if you get these wrong, you get your citizenship card taken away. <laughs> The House of Representatives has how many voting members? 435. Yes. Well, you guys are good. Okay. 
Name one war fought by the U.S. in the 1800s. One war that the U.S. fought in in the 1800s. Spanish American. Yes. 1812, Civil War. Yes. Before he was president, Eisenhower was a general. What war was he in? World War II. Yes. Who wrote the Federalist Papers? Uh, Madison, Hamilton, and Jay. Yes. Wow, she's so good. Are you a history teacher? Oh, I should have asked first. <laughs> you cheated. Okay. He was. That's why you volunteered. They were both history teachers. That's not fair. I'm going to do a pre-screening next time I do this. Okay. Bonus question. What are the Federalist Papers? They, they were written to encourage people into ratification of the Constitution in the late 19th, or late 18th century. Yes, correct. And so um, it says here uh, that other newspapers published these essays, and so they became known as the Federalist Papers, and they were written in a book called The Federalist. And today, people still read them to help them understand the Constitution. Thank you for playing. So, okay, you all who don't know, <laughs> if you need a refresher, we are starting a new round of citizenship classes, April 4th, so you're welcome to come. <laughs> So, um, you know, those are pretty hard questions, um, and those were just a few of them. As you can imagine, um, most of the folks that come to our citizenship classes, you know, English isn't their first language. Um, some of them uh, didn't graduate high schools, and some of them, it's the first time they are in a school setting when they come to the, the colleges and um, study with us. So it's a very big effort that they uh, put forward to pass their exam. Did you have a question? Can we attend? Um, we've never had community members attend, but we do um, encourage community members to volunteer with us. So the classes are taught by teachers, and we have assistants in every other classroom. And we offer three classes, a full English class, a Spanish English class, and only Spanish class. So if you're interested in volunteering, talk to me afterwards and we can uh, see how we can fit you in. I have one more question. Are the classes offered free of charge? Yes, the classes are free. And for students who complete all of the series, uh, our partners, Lutheran Community Services, they have an immigration counseling services program and they can get a discount to get their services there if they go through the series. Is there an issue if they're illegal and they want to take your citizenship? Well, if you're undocumented, we try not to use the word illegal. It's um, not a very uh, humanizing word. But if you're undocumented, you um, need to find out if you um, have a way to first become a legal permanent resident or a green card holder. Um, once you have a green card, you have to wait at least five years before you apply to become a U.S. citizen. So you need to be, uh, to have an opportunity to get a green card first. Not everybody does. Uh, maybe at some other time I can come back and explain what are the options for folks to uh, obtain a green card and be on the path towards citizenship. Uh, but that's a myth that I think a lot of us don't know about, that if you're undocumented, sometimes you don't have a path towards citizenship. And so we also do, um, a lot of our work is advocacy based and it's depending on the issue that our community is most um, interested in learning about or needs more information, um, we decide our programming based on those issues. We are very intentional about creating community partnerships either with the public libraries, um, social service agencies, schools, etc. So this picture here um, is a meeting with the Newburgh, uh, the previous superintendent for the school district. Um, she was having a meeting with 
parents to talk about some issues that were going on in the district, wanting to get some, you know, a, an opportunity for the parents to voice their concerns and hear directly from her. We also do advocacy for specific legislation or ballot measures that affect um, our immigrant Latino community. Um, for example, this past election, we did a lot of advocacy work for Measure 105, uh, the ballot measure that was attempting to repeal the over 30-year-old Oregon um, anti-racial profiling law, sometimes commonly known as the sanctuary law. So we were very uh, busy during election season advocating and educating the community about how that would impact our local community in Yampo County. We also partner uh, very often with our statewide partners. So in Yamhill County, we are the only nonprofit organization that advocates for Latino immigrants. Um, our closest partner organization that does similar work is Scalsa Oregon in Salem or Pecun based in Woodburn. So we're pretty isolated here and we rely a lot on our statewide partners to do some of our advocacy work. Um, we, during election season, we uh, make a huge effort to educate the community about um, what are the issues that are going to be voted on, who are the candidates that are going to be on the ballot. So we do a lot of that education and we encourage folks, especially young people, to register to vote. Uh, so this picture here uh, was a few years ago and we were at a Mexican rodeo getting some of our young folks registered. Um, while sometimes it's common that our parents are not eligible to vote, there are a lot of kids that are of voting age that um, you know, maybe for whatever reason they haven't been involved in the election process, but we try to get them on board. We have a program called ALERT, the Law Enforcement Relations Team. And we partner with the McMinnville Police Department and the Yamhill County Sheriff's Office to do some positive relationship building and create trust among law enforcement and the uh, Latino immigrant community. Uh, this picture that you see right here is a community forum that we held at St. James Catholic Church here in McMinnville. And it's hard to see, but we have Chief Scales and Captain Tim Simons up there on the podium, and they're just explaining the different ways that the police department can uh, better serve the community, what are different ways for our Spanish-speaking community members to reach out if they need help of some sorts, how to report a crime, what kind of forms they would be required to fill. So it's very basic information, but again, sometimes uh, the communication between the Spanish-speaking community and our uh, different uh, city departments or agencies um, requires different strategies to get that communication across. So we do things like this. So some upcoming programming, uh, we have two programs that we had paused and but we're going to pick them up back again. Our Latinas Juntas en Comunidad, which in English means uh, Latinas Together in Community, it's a leadership program, and our Latinx Professionals Network. And then I'm also going to share with you about the Driver's Licenses for All campaign. So the Latinas Juntas en Comunidad program, program excuse me, is a women's leadership program. Um, we offer these about two times a year and they're workshops that gather um, for eight weeks, and it's focused on building advocacy and civic engagement uh, skills in uh, mostly first and second generation women. Uh, we focus on women because oftentimes uh, we tend to be stay-at-home moms and sometimes become isolated in our communities, and uh, really the woman in the, in the immigrant family plays a big role. You know, she's the um, caregiver of our children and she holds a lot of responsibilities in the household. So we want to be able to empower her to not only uh, gain leadership skills, 
but feel like they play an important part, important part in the general community and um, know about the different opportunities to get involved. So through the workshops, we cover things like how to um, get involved in the educational system and healthcare, uh, local community. Um, and in general, we uh, try to figure out what are things that interest the group of women for the cohort and do a shared activity or project with them. So this picture here is uh, some of the women who were part of our last series and they are in the lobby of the McMinnville Police Department. So they took a tour and learn about the different ways that our uh, police uh, officials work really hard to uh, ensure our public safety. Our Latinx Professionals Network. You might have heard this word here and there, Latinx. Uh, so what does it mean? It's just a gender, gender neutral way to talk about folks who come from Latin America. The Spanish language is very gendered. It's very uh, masculine, so Latinx is gender neutral. So if you hear myself or other people later on, that's what it means. Uh, so we have an online network of uh, professionals that are of Latino heritage. We have about 245 people that are part of the network. Um, and we share employment and educational opportunities. So if you, uh, within your networks, are looking to recruit folks um, from the Latino community, Spanish speaking, that sort of thing, uh, you are free to send me those job postings and I can put them on this online network for you. So let me know if, if you would like to take advantage of that. We have uh, previously gathered in person, but we're looking to restructure that. What we've realized is that while um, we have Latino professionals that live in this area, sometimes it's hard to attend events after work uh, for various reasons. And we're looking to do quarterly in-person gatherings with um, current folks that are employed in Yamhill County. So not necessarily living here, but employed here because um, we've seen that number grow over the years. Uh, most of the people that are involved are first generation college students, or college graduates, excuse me. So we really built this network because a lot of us have needed to figure things out after graduation on our own, where we've needed guidance or support. We um, have needed to lean on each other and, and figure out how to overcome certain barriers and challenges. So um, upcoming advocacy work that we will be focusing on is going to be about the driver's licenses for all campaign. And that's what this blue and green handout is about. So I wanted to talk to you about this uh, because we're wanting more folks to help us contact our legislators and support this bill. The bill is called Equal Access to Roads Act, and what it is trying to accomplish is to create a two-tiered system um, of driver's licenses and identification cards. So um, we, as a state, are required by the federal government to, pro to provide real ID compliant driver's licenses and IDs. And I'll explain in a little bit what that means. And so this bill is going to advocate that we also provide what would be called standard driver's licenses and ID cards. So to give you some history, the Federal Real ID Act was passed in 2005 by Congress. And this was because of a recommendation by the 9-11 Commission this was a commission that was created after the terrorist attacks in New York City. And because uh, some of those individuals that were responsible for the attacks uh, boarded an airplane with um, government issued IDs, they recommended, uh, or driver's licenses, they recommended that um, we tighten up how, uh, who was eligible to obtain those driver's licenses or IDs. So um, the Real ID Act established minimum eligibility and physical security standards for driver's licenses 
and IDs. And so uh, the states were asked to change some of the requirements to obtain these driver's licenses and IDs so that they're compliant with these standards. Um, it also said that only folks who have this real ID or driver's license can board federally regulated airplanes, certain federal buildings, and nuclear power plants. And so uh, states were given um, extensions to meet these requirements because it takes a lot of restructuring of uh, every state's uh, driver's license and ID requirements and how they issue those. And so Oregon has um, a deadline of October 10th of this year. We've been given uh, multiple extensions to meet these federally uh, mandated uh, standards. And so by October of this year, there will be some uh, changes to the way that Oregon's DMV issues driver's licenses and IDs. Um, and they will be uh, called the Real ID Compliant um, Driver's License. The Federal Real ID Act also says that states can decide if they want to create um, a different driver's license or ID that does not meet these standards, but will only be used for the purposes of driving um, and identifying yourself. So you wouldn't be able to board an airplane, enter certain facilities with that non-compliant identification. So how did this affect Oregonians? So in 2008, or Oregon under Governor Ted Kulingowski, changed the requirements to get a driver's license. And so it said that in order to get one, you would have had to prove that you are either a US citizen or you have um, permission to be in the country legally. Uh, so this affected anywhere between 80,000 um, to 100,000 Oregonians. And it's not just folks who are immigrants, it also affects people who don't have all the documentation to prove their identity, uh, citizenship, or legal status. So it could be folks uh, like seniors who maybe were born at home and don't have that paperwork, uh, folks who are houseless that are very tra transient and um, you know, have a hard time finding that documentation, veterans, survivors of domestic violence, or survivors of natural disasters. All of these populations um, are affected uh, by needing to provide that extra identification paperwork. And so for our immigrant community, um, that meant that for folks who are here without documents, they could no longer renew their driver's license or obtain one. And nationally, um, a study reported that deportations due to traffic violations have increased by 138%. Uh, since 2016. So you might wonder like how or why over a traffic violation. Well, for example, in Oregon, if you are driving without a driver's license and a police officer sees that maybe you have a broken taillight or maybe you didn't make a complete stop in a four-way uh, road, um, they could pull you over and address the situation, whatever that traffic violation was, but you're required to identify yourself. So if you don't have an Oregon driver's license or an ID, then you don't have a legal way to identify yourself. And sometimes at the um, discretion of the officer, they could give you a warning or they could say, you know, I'm going to take you in because I need to find out who you are. Um, and so you'll be taken in, uh, you know, your information will be gathered, you'll be fingerprinted, run through a national database, and um, they can find out there if you are here with documents or not. And so for some folks who have had a criminal history um, and the law enforcement agency uh, thinks that you should not be here in the country because of your um, crime or, you know, et cetera, whatever that decision is, uh, you will maybe be on the path towards deportation. And so, yeah. Is our local sheriff and <coughs> state police, are they required to contact ICE and do they cooperate? So this is what this ballot measure was about. 
So the law says that law enforcement agencies cannot contact ICE if they know somebody is undocumented unless there is a suspe suspicion that you've committed a crime or you have been found to commit a crime, then they can communicate with ICE. Okay? So... Is it considered a crime if you've been speeding? Is that, that can count as a crime for you? Um, I'll specify that I, I believe, this is getting very technical, I believe that um, it is in violation, if you're in violation of a federal immigration law, um, that doesn't constitute a crime. But if you're driving without a license, for example, I can't remember if that's considered the crime or not, to be honest with you, so I don't want to give you an answer. But I can check on that and get back to you. Yeah. So you're basically saying that a state violation could be a crime attributed at the federal level for punishment. What I'm saying is that if you have committed a traffic violation and you cannot identify yourself, you run the risk of being uh, fingerprinted, run through this national database, and identified as being undocumented. And so, um, by July of next year, Oregon will have um, implemented what we call enhanced real ID Oregon driver's licenses and IDs. And so this picture that you see here is what the Oregon DMV has said is a sample of what the enhanced physical features will be. Some of these have already been tested in Salem as a pilot program. And to get an enhanced real ID, so if you want to board an airplane with this, you will need to pay an additional $20. Um, so right now the cost to renew your driver's license is $40, it'll be $60. To get a brand new one, it's currently $60, it's going to be $80. Um, and so some of the enhanced security features will be um, the new color design, there will be um, a hologram feature to it, uh, your photo will appear twice maybe, uh, the 21, under 21, uh, driver's licenses and IDs will look a little different. And so these will meet that real ID uh, requirements. Sorry, my computer's slow. And so what this bill is proposing, the Equal Access to Roads Act, is that the standard driver's license um, will still require folks to prove their identity, to prove that they live in Oregon, they will still need to take the knowledge and the driving exam. They will still need to provide uh, proof of insurance and pay the fees. Um, but there will be a privacy protection that says, um, if you cannot uh, prove your legal status here, your information will not be shared with the federal government through the DMV. There is going to be an anti-discrimination clause that says if uh, you possess a standard uh, driver's license or ID, you will not be treated differently uh, compared to folks who have the enhanced driver's license. And again, we expect that anywhere from 80,000 to 100,000 Oregonians will benefit from having this other option. And um, it'll provide um, a form for folks to legally identify themselves. Um, and of course, we'll have more um, folks who are driving with a driver's license and know the rules of the road. Um, this standard driver's license, though, I want to clarify, will not be um, something that folks can use to register to vote. You cannot use it for that. You cannot board a federally regulated airplane. You cannot enter certain federal uh, governments. And you cannot enter the nuclear power plants. So if you possess a standard driver's license, and you do want to fly, you have the option of uh, bringing your passport with you instead. It's more affordable too for folks who can't pay that increased fee. 
And so really we are advocating for this uh, bill because we believe that you know, driving is a core need um, every day for our families and individuals. You know, here in Yampo County, a lot of our families are needing to drive, you know, anywhere from 30 to 50 minutes to get to work. And so not having access to the documents that are required to get a driver's license is a big barrier, especially for folks who, you know, are just really wanting to go to work and provide for their families, uh, take their kids to school or the doctor, etc. And for some of our folks who are um, our immigrant neighbors who are here without documents, it really puts you in a tough situation where you need to decide, am I going to drive without a license to be able to, um, you know, take care of my family and risk arrest or deportation? Um, so, you know, it's something you really got to um, weigh. It, it really puts us um, immigrant families in danger of having our families separated. You know, I think this bill also upholds Oregon's values where we uh, value looking out for our neighbors and taking care of each other, um, treating each other as we would want to be treated. And so we really think that, you know, Oregonians shouldn't have to live in fear of being deported or separated from their families over a traffic stop. You know, we, we can disagree on how to fix our broken immigration system. It's very complex and needs more work. Um, but, you know, I think we all value family and keeping families together. Um, you know, a lot of our immigrants uh, that come here are in the search for a better life, in search of their American dream. Um, and so we want to make sure that we are, um, you know, not standing in the way of that. <laughs> um, and ultimately requiring that everybody uh, go through these exams and know the rules of the road uh, to have a driver's license makes our roads safer and our community safer. You know, as a driver, I also don't want to one day be rear-ended and have the other person tell me, you know what, I'm really sorry, but I don't have insurance because I cannot get a driver's license. You know, so it affects us too, even though um, we have a driver's license and insurance ourselves. Um, and so, you know, especially for uh, uh, folks or excuse me, for states that have these two-tiered systems, there's 13 other states that have already passed these, and they have seen um, a reduction in their number of traffic accidents and hit-and-run incidents, and the number of uh, insured drivers has increased and uh, significantly in these 13 other states. So, you know, we're really following a model that has worked in other parts of the country. And so, um, if you would like to support uh, the bill, it is HB 2015, and our local representatives in Salem are actually on the committee that this bill has been assigned to. Both Senator Boquist and Representative Noble are co-chairs of the uh, subcommittee on transportation. So if you would be so inclined to help us and advocate uh, that they support this bill. Um, I've put up their information there, or of course you can go online and find it. Um, and so um, if you have any other thoughts after this presentation, um, my contact information is there. Our office is just down the hall as well, so we're pretty close. <laughs> yes? I don't know yet. I haven't talked to them so far. We will be taking a delegation of Yamhill County folks with us over to their offices on uh, March 26th. So we will be having those conversations and sharing how this bill would affect our local immigrant neighbors. But I'd encourage you to ask them and um, ask them where they stand. Of this bill along with uh, like insurance companies? There's a statewide coalition that is gathering those endorsements. I know that one of the um, companies or associations that have really pushed for this is the Oregon Nurseries Association. So, mm -hmm. and 
Yep, so um, they are working, the folks that are leading this campaign are working on getting those endorsements. Yeah, and I think for our community, um, it really makes sense because a lot of our workforce in the agriculture sector is very dependent on immigrant workers. immigrants are you speaking for all immigrants in terms of my presentation or the bill I'm sorry. am I speaking in terms of the presentation or the bill specifically well you come across as advocating for Latinos which is good but there are other immigrants lots of them who's advocating for them and shouldn't you do a bit of that too as, as an American so, thank you for calling me an American, first of all. Um, and I advocate for Latino immigrants because that is the largest immigrant population in Yamhill County. Our organization serves only Yamhill County. But to advocate for other, excuse me, for other immigrants, there are organizations throughout the state. I would assume that there located based on where there's a bigger population of other kinds of immigrants. For example, in Portland, there is an organization called APANO. It stands for Asian Pacific American Network of Oregon, and they advocate for Asian Pacific American immigrants. Um, and so throughout the state, there are organizations that focus on specific populations. We focus on Latinos because we saw a need in Yampo <coughs> County to advocate for this population. We have a growing refugee population as well, but we believe in being led by the people that we serve. So I myself, as a Latino immigrant, I don't feel that I am able to advocate for somebody that is coming from a country in Africa because I don't know the experience and I don't know the challenges. and so. We really believe in being a grassroots-led um, organization. So it wouldn't make sense for me to advocate about something that I'm not familiar with. Can you understand that sounds a little bit clannish to the people? I think I can understand, but I think our position is that we are advocating for what we know. We, th these are the issues that we know, not that they're more important than issues that other immigrants face, but we're not the experts in those other immigrant issues. I, I'll just add that the uh, citizenship classes that you hold have had the German and other nationalities. Mm -hmm. So the citizenship classes are more totally cool. Right. Yes, so thank you, Ron. He mentioned that our citizenship classes have immigrants from other nationalities. Uh, we've had folks from Germany, from, we currently have one from China right now. Um, and so we are not closed to offering our services only to Latino immigrants. Um, they're open to anybody who would want to come and learn. That American flag you had up there was who wants to be a citizen? doesn't say Latinos wants to be a citizen yet. That's what you're advocating, but it should say who wants to be a citizen, all of us. So like well, the I'm driver's not... license for all program is not specific to Latinos, Yes, correct? yes, so our citizenship classes are open to anybody who wants to become a U.S. citizen. We're, again, we're, we don't close off the program just to Latino immigrants. And yes, the Equal Access to Roads Act is going to benefit beyond the immigrant population. Like I mentioned, folks who are survivors of domestic violence, veterans, houseless folks, um, some of our senior citizens. So, you know, a lot of these issues intersect and we really believe in the power of collaborating and building partnerships, and so that's why we're advocating for this. Just so you can relax, our family has married into married with Latinos. <laughs> oh, good. Well, thanks. We have other questions over here. I want to make sure we address them. There are churches, uh, just the, you know, a, a Serbian Orthodox Church and a Greek Orthodox Church, and I, I just don't think it's appropriate to call that clannish. 
Thank you. you. Know, we, we, we have, everybody has an organization that they could go to. Do you, by the way, do you have, do you have the statistics, um, the, the recent incarceration of, of immigrants in Sheridan at the prison? Um, do you have a, a, an ethnic uh, breakdown on that? What we know is that um, they were coming from 16 different countries, and the majority of them were actually coming from Southeast Asia. Um, we had a very small number who were coming from Latin America. So sometimes people thought that everybody was coming from Latin America, but that wasn't the case. We had people come over from, um, and Megan, you can help me if I don't remember all the countries. We had people from Nepal, from Russia, from India. Uh, we had people coming from um, certain countries out of Africa, uh, some from Honduras, Me Mexico, El Salvador, uh, but like I said, a majority of them were coming from Southeast Asia. Um, and so, yes, and a lot of them were fleeing uh, religious and political persecution. Um, and so, thank you for asking that question. I heard you say you're a nonprofit. Are you also a 501c3? Yes, so we are a. 501c3 organization. We first started as a community group um, after some local community members organized two immigration conferences in Dayton back in 2011. And they um, realized, you know, we learned a lot about immigration related issues and there's lots more education and dialogue that needs to happen. So um, by 2014, the organization became a 501c3. But for many years, um, volunteers worked as a community group. The city and their strategic plans talked a lot about trying to engage more of the Latinx community into the civil uh, uh, organizations and groups. Have they reached out um, to work with you guys yet? And um, yeah. How do, what kind of steps do you see helping get more of the representation? So I know the city um, did involve Unidos in part of, part of their focus groups as they were preparing for the strategic plan. Um, we have not been able to sit down specifically and talk about ways that Unidos can get more involved. I know we've been invited to be part of certain committees, um, but I know that uh, they really look forward to having those conversations to bring those diverse voices. Um, I know that, um, I'm sorry, I'm blanking out. Uh, the city manager, yeah. Jeff, yes. Uh, he has invited us to be part of a, a committee to talk about ways to reach out more. Um, and so a lot of the work that we do with the Latino population is to redefine how we view leadership. So in the Latino culture, um, you know, leadership is sometimes, it looks more of a group effort. And so we're often taught to be part of a larger collaboration and not to boast our individual contributions so much. So part of our leadership training and development involves redefining how uh, we are involved in the community so that we feel like we're not being boastful about ourselves, but really we're part of the big picture. So um, once the real ID driver, real ID compliant driver's licenses are issued, they will be $20 more. So to get a brand new one, it will be $80. To renew it, it's going to be 60. Okay, so in a scenario where a woman is a, a, a woman and the children are in a domestic violence situation and they've left home and they don't want to go back and get their papers and they need a driver's license, so they say, well, I don't have very much money, so I'll get the standard one. Are then they making a choice not to vote? No, because the DMV already has a pretty rigorous system in place to um, screen and verify that folks who get a driver's license, uh, they have a separate system to verify that they're uh, citizens and eligible to vote. So again, just because you have the standard driver's license doesn't mean you will be eligible to vote. Um, there's other ways that you can make sure that you're okay, able so to you vote. Said that in that summary that you, that you could not vote with that. Correct. So 
what I mean is that you can't register to vote with that standard. You can't use it as proof of being a citizen, ultimately, is what it comes down to. But you can still go to, you know, the county clerk's office and fill out your voter registration form. You, in the voter registration form, you need to provide your social security number mm -hmm, and provide your ID. So if you don't have your birth certificate, you can provide your social security number and write it down on there. Does that make sense? Okay. Oh, do we have time for that? We could be here another three hours. Yeah. Um, you know, it's something that I think is very tough to have a simple answer to. It's very complex. It's very hard. Um, I think that oftentimes folks who are kids of undocumented parents, uh, there's more empathy and compassion because we've been brought um, against our will, but um, I think that there needs to be a lot of humanization to the issue. Um, and that's part of the mission of Unidos, is to bring that uh, personal story, personal perspective on immigration and the process to obtain legal status, because sometimes, you know, it's really easy to just focus on numbers and what's on the news, what's making the headlines. But, you know, we want to bring it down to a personal level and really talk about, you know, my neighbor down the street who goes to the same church as me or their kids go to the same school as my child. You know, I want to get to know them and know why they're here, uh, why they decided to immigrate and what are the barriers for them to get their legal status. I think there's a lot of education that still needs to happen so that folks can maybe change their mind about, um, you know, whatever they think about folks who are here undocumented. Uh, I know that in the past there have been multiple attempts to fix this immigration system, but there's just so many different parts. There's the border security, there's the you know, eligibility requirements to get a green card. It's a lot. And I'm happy to come back and explain what it is like to go through the legal process, um, but you know, it's not an easy answer. your time and for your